Hi, this, uh, my name is Kevin Millington, and I'm happy to be the president of the uh, Empire State Aerosciences Museum here in Glenville, and uh, is a continuation of our uh, oral and video history series. I'm really happy to be here with um, a special uh, special person at the museum, John Panoski. Welcome, John. Thank you. John is a uh, a great volunteer at the museum. He's uh, currently vice president has been on the board of directors for years and has extensive experience not only flying, but here at the museum. Um, John, give us a little background on your, your childhood. Where, where were you born? Well, you I, was, I was a World War II baby. I was born just prior to World War II, January 1939. Uh, I grew up in Schenectady, and uh, I have vague memories of uh, the war. I had, uh, family members. I had an uncle who was a lieutenant commander in the Navy in the Pacific, involved in several battles, including the Aleutians, and he would come home and tell his stories. And my other uncle was in the Army. He was in the uh, Third Army and uh, Patton's Army, if you would, and uh, he was involved in the uh, first crossing of the Rhine River into Aachen, Germany, and brought mm. back many, many stories and artifacts and what have you. But to make a long story short, I came decision time and uh, I decided, you know, in lieu of the fact I had a younger brother and, uh, you know, uh, I had hoped to go to college, but I thought maybe my brother would go. I'll join the Air Force. <laughs> John, I remember, I remember you telling me a really, really good story that one of your first experiences with aviation was a child here in, in Schenectady, right here at the airport. You would hang out at the airport, being the airplane. Oh, yeah. Out, that and, was, that, and that someone at the time, the 109th Air Force was 109th Fighter Group. It was 139th Fighter Interceptor. Oh, okay, Squadron. and that, and that uh, tell us about that uh, shortly. About well, that. I, I, on, as you mentioned, yeah, I was about, uh, I don't know, 12, 13, maybe 14 years old. I, I think it was about 13 years old at the time. It was in the 50s. It was just before the Korean War, in fact, uh, because 1951 was the beginning of the Korean War. And they had two B-26s. Those were Douglas B-26s, not the Martin. And both of those were taken back to be flown in the Korean uh, effort. Uh, those were utility aircraft. And, the, uh, of course, the fighter unit at the time, they had 27 F-47s, which was the World War II P-47s. Well, that was a legendary fighter in World War II. Yeah, these were D-models. And okay. a number of the pilots that flew in the unit at the time were combat vets. So after, after the war... The Air um, Guard formed the, in 1949. These were passed along to the Air National Guard yes. in, the, in the late 40s and 50s. And the yeah, P-47 after, was a legendary fighter. Yes. And you uh, got to see them. Well, uh, at the time, the security at Schenectady County Airport wasn't too secure. <laughs> and as a you know, summertime, I'd ride my bike out, and I'd back a lunch sometimes and sit there watching these guys work on the airplanes. And one day, a guy by the name of Al Luther, who was a combat vet in the Pacific, he came over and says, Hey, kid. He, says, <laughs> he called me over, and he says, You want to help us out? And uh, one of the armorers was uh, ar armoring, getting ready to armor the uh, machine guns and 50 calibers, four of them in each wing, and they had a tow airplane that would drag what they call a, a, a drag line and a, a sleeve, which was a big, long, maybe 30, 40 foot sleeve, and they'd go out over Lake Ontario and the planes would, would uh, shoot at that sleeve with different colored uh, painted tips on the bullets, and yeah. one airplane would have yellow, one would have red, green, oh, blue, whatever, okay. and that way there, when they came in and dropped that sleeve, uh, the armorers could pick off the colors and see how many mm -hmm. hits from that particular airplane. But anyway, they did, the guy gave me a screwdriver. He says, see those airplanes? He says, see this panel? So I jumped up on the wing. He said, I want you to take the panels off. I forget, four or five airplanes that come down the line, which is what I did. Well, that sort of sealed the friendship from there on. And uh, I would go over there, and of course, I... They'd invite me to have my lunch with them, you know, lunch break, and we'd sit under a wing of a P-47. I, I was so enthused. And, but what really clicked me off was uh, uh, Al one day says, uh, he says, hey, come on with me. He says, we've got to run this airplane up. And I, you know, I said, run the airplane up? What's he going to do here? So uh, they had done some magneto changes or whatever, carburetor change, and they had to check the engine out. And so he jumps in the cockpit, he says, okay, jump on my lap. And I sat on his lap and he took the stick, pulled it back, put the seat belt around and yanked it tight so the stick wouldn't move. And of course that pulled the elevator up, kept the tail down. He said, we're gonna start this animal. 
and he went through the complete cockpit checklist, pointed out, but he says, now I want you to start this airplane. I said, me start the airplane. Oh, God, that's, that's a great story. And you were there uh, about 15 years old then? And, yeah, I was less than that. It was probably about 14, 13, 14. But anyway, uh, I remember the sequence, you know, we had to crack the throttle, mixture control, uh, primer, there was a primer in the upper right-hand corner, and then uh, you had the battery switch on, and then you hit energize, or or, and yeah, energize, and you could hear the starter motor go, ee, you know, increasing in RPM and speed. And he says, "Okay, now engage it." And you hit it, engage. And what happened was it had a flywheel on it, and it would then engage the engine, and it had the momentum Start and energy the to turn the engine over. And it, he says, "Count eight blades, and then turn that mag switch on." And I counted the blades: one, two, three. In other words, two rotations of the engine. Uh, the P forty seven had a huge, as I recall, it was an R twenty eight engine. It was a Pratt Whitney. It, it drove a big, uh, big four liter propeller. Oh, yeah, yeah, very big, powerful plane. Yeah, yeah. yeah that was a good story. But anyway, when that engine started, it filled the cockpit up with smoke, and that was like a, an elixir. Right? <laughs> I was hooked. <laughs> I had to be in the air force. So that's how you got your uh, your uh, your your flying ball. Why don't you tell us about a typical mission? What would your uh, missions be? Well. Put it simply, sun down, gear up. <laughs> a lot of night flying, but no. Uh, now, the airplane, uh, of course, uh, it's a crew airplane. Uh, crew, normal crew. The basic crew, as they would call it, would be uh, pilot, co-pilot, flight engineer. And, of course, uh, over water, we'd have to have a nav. I mean, for transition, for flying around the flagpole, if, as they call it, you'd only need, basically, pilot, co-pilot, flight engineer, and an observer, either a flight mechanic or a loadmaster, mm -hmm. usually a loadmaster. And that would be for training and transitional okay. training for pilots. We may have three or four pilots on board. Uh, each pilot would get maybe a couple landings, takeoffs, and then another guy would jump in. A sure. certain instructor sure. would be there or a flight examiner for a check ride, that kind of thing. But going on a live mission, you have to have one, sometimes two, depending on the length of the mission, two navigators and, of course, two mm -hmm. load masters normally for a cargo mission, okay. a freight mission. Well, were your normal missions... Transporting uh, cargo from anything from women's stockings to dead bodies and everything in between. I mean, we've had just to bring back combat uh, casualties out of Vietnam, out of Da Nang, Tan Sanu, Cameron Bay, bring them back to Honolulu. The Tripler General mm -hmm. Hospital uh, was a big hospital, of course, the mortuary. Uh, oh, they wound up, you know, we bring back a number of uh, combat mm -hmm. casualties and. Uh, uh, you know, it would be scary sometimes, be, especially taking off at night out of Da Nang. Of course, you had to turn all the lights out because anything with light on, they shoot at you. You could see the fireflies going off. It looked like fireflies popping at you. And it's a stressful fights. flight, huh? huh? Stressful mission, I would think. Well, as soon as you, as soon as you broke around, uh, you mm -hmm. pull the gear up and turn all the lights mm -hmm. off. All the beacon lights, uh, landing lights, the wheel wall lights, anything. It, Turn all the lights off because you know they could spot the airplane and start shooting at it. Sure. We... What was your job as flight engineer? Where did you sit well, in the? Uh, okay. What was your crew position? Uh, my crew position was just behind the pilot and co-pilot, okay. just about where that bubble is. That's a nav. That's a navigator's bubble. Okay. I had a panel just facing to the right wing uh, with all the engine controls, and uh, they would uh, control, uh, of course, the fuel system, electrical system, pressurization. Uh, the turbo trough had turbochargers, I had control of each turbo, I can uh, synchronize them all and had one manual control. Uh, all four throttles and then the overhead panels would have either circuit breakers, uh, fire control lights, fire warning lights, uh, and then fire handles. In fact, they had a little unique story down there one time, I came out to pre-flight early in the morning. It was Sunday morning as I recall, I forget, we had a training mission. Uh, overwater nav mission for navigators. But anyway, uh, I hear this strange engine sound. It wasn't a piston engine or a radio engine. It was a smoother sound. It was almost like a P-51. And in fact, I looked, and it was a P-51. And it came right over the runway, pulled up in a, in a classic fighter approach, turned around, came back down, went and landed. And the guy jumps out with an orange flight suit on, and it was hands on his head like this. 
on the runway. And I'm free flying the airplane, and all of a sudden, all these gumball machines come flying out, the fire trucks and the police and all that. And what it was was a Dominican Republic P-51 that had shot up a radio station. It had a palace coup or something in, in, in oh Dominican. Oh, my God, really? And, and he had, had flown to Puerto Rico to rain He flew and considered himself a, uh, you know, uh, surrendered or surrendered to the U.S. military. Oh, and the airplane, they towed it off and they pulled it next to us. Well, I got a picture of me standing on the wing. I'd like to see that. Sometime. I got to find it, though. I'd like I, to it's see a, that. The guy yeah. took it. It was 35 millimeter. Right, so uh, did you have any memorable uh, experiences? Yeah. Uh, one time, yeah, off the coast of uh, where we were going, going up to Alaska, and we had it was at night, and we had to go through a. It wasn't really a storm per se, but it was a, a heavy uh, precip at altitude, and all of a sudden the cockpit started to turn blue, and there was glass out in front, and it was growing. All of a sudden, there's sparks and electricity, you know, like St. Elmo's fire. It scared the living daylights out. No I had never seen oh, that yeah. before. And then, uh, of course, getting hit by lightning, coming out of Myrtle Beach one time. That scared a little bit. Oh my God, his plane got hit by lightning? Oh, yeah. I, mean, well, the, I would imagine, I mean, a tanker carrying a lot of uh, flammable well, fuel. We had two antennas here. And, of course, there was a radar dome here for the, for the uh, navigator's radar for hookup. Uh, but anyway, these two HF antennas went up to the tail. And we got hit by lightning. And I had my hands on a throttle because you had to reduce RPM and reduce airspeed to 160 knots. They call it penetration speed. You know, to, you go 2,700 RPM to get gyroscopic stability with the propellers. The highest RPM you could get on those engines without over boosting, and the slower airspeed to go mm -hmm. penetrate this thunderstorm. And all of a sudden, bang! A big explosion. I looked back. We had a monorail went down the center of the fuselage and it glowed all the way down. When it hit the tail, it just oh exploded. God, really? And, oh my God. And when it hit, I could feel the heat on my arm because I had my hands on the throttles trying to stabilize it and I could feel it instantly. Like Sorry, somebody passed me, what year was this or when was this? Oh, I don't know, 60, 63, 4, somewhere in there. I forget. So you're taking off from Myrtle Beach Air yeah, Force Base in Myrtle Beach. Um, South, and we popped out of that in South Carolina yeah. and you're hit by lightning. The mid-air uh, mid lightning strikes, so how, how did you, what would happen? Actually, well, we landed, I think we, went to, we wound up in Dover, but uh, all the prop tips were blackened, were burnt, and the one antenna, when we landed, we kept hearing this bang, bang, bang on the side of the fuselage, like somebody not going to get in, uh, and it was the, one of the, uh, had ceramic insulators on it, it was you know, fluttering in the wind, and it kept banging on the fuselage. It, it had burned off the pylon. There's a mount here. The antenna had taken a full shot and melted the wire. Oh, my God. That was a stressful uh, attack of the story, John.